Hello magpies, and welcome back to the homelands of heterodoxy, wherein I give you rules and narrative overviews for the purpose of playing in over 40 different nations of Faerun. To enhance your knowledge of the Forgotten Realms, to adopt my modifications and to situate your character in my world, or to inspire your own world building projects. Today, we find ourselves among old empires, in the footprints of gods who walk the earth as kings. And we behold the largest single political force in all of Faerun, being the indomitable desert empire of mighty Mulhoran whose warrior priests and whose war chariots have conquered and dominated almost the entire Eastern Palatinate. The gods of Mulharand evaded the worst of the divine spell plague by taking mortal form. Their essence passed down through a lineage of pharaohs and high priests being the manifestations of their own unique pantheon of gods worshipped nowhere else across Faerun. These god kings held the late Emperor Azun in high esteem, for in their eyes he was like a god among men for the weight of his accomplishments. But since his passing, they have shown no such regard for other mortal rulers. All except perhaps the Jin Rajas of Kalimshan. Thus, advancing like the thunderous steps of a mighty elephant, the borders of Mulharand creep outward year by year, swallowing up neighboring states into their empire and imposing their religion and their culture onto old enemies as well as onto lands of cultural importance. Whilst mere tributary states are afforded the right of self-determination in exchange for supplication to the living gods. In Great Mulharand, arcane magic is distrusted, while evidence of the divine is commonplace. Nearly 6,000 years ago, a people known as the Mulan were brought to Toril from another world to be slaves of the Empire, now known as Old Imaskar. The Mulan brought with them their own religion and nearly 4,000 years ago they rose in open rebellion against their masters. The Amaskari king was struck down by the god Horus himself, who then took on his slain father's mantle to become Horus Ray and rose to lead the pantheon. And today, the prime deity leads Mulharand itself as a mortal, an avatar of the god. Many in the West hold a false belief that all of the folk of Mulharad are but slaves to their pharaoh and his priesthood, when in fact, being former slaves themselves, the Mulan long since outlawed the ownership of people by divine edict. Perhaps outsiders simply cannot imagine that the great pyramids and the temples of Mulharad were built by willing labor. But in reality, the production of great works is an essential part of the cultural consciousness of Mulharand, by which mortal exertions may transform the earth to resemble the divine, and thus elevate consciousness to a higher level. Appropriately, Mulharand is home to the finest mathematicians, engineers, astronomers, and architects in all of Faerun, and quite possibly in the whole of Toril itself. 
Inhabitants of Mulharan speak Mulharandi as their common tongue, and they favour lightweight, curved weapons, farmers and soldiers both. Thus they may take for their regional equipment either a sickle or a falchion, being a reskinned scimitar, or those who serve the living gods directly as priests or as scholars, may take two second level divine spell scrolls. Alternately, anyone not fitting into either category who is justifiably wary of the many venomous creatures of the desert, may take a potion of lesser restoration. The major faiths of Mulharand reflect their own unique blending of land, religion and politics. Their pantheon consists of Horus Rey, who rules as Pharaoh, but also the gods Anhur, Geb, Hathor, Isis, Nephthys, Osiris, Sebek, Set and Thoth, who each take mortal form as high priests. Shrines may also be found to honour Gond, Mask, Mistra and Red Knight. Mulharand could not possibly be a clearer analogue for ancient Egypt. This one is totally cut and dry, though in the shadows of gods is a sufficiently diverse empire that one might perhaps compare its mid-level intrigues and petty politicking to the machinations of the Ottoman courts, and their great works and their grasp of sciences that exceed all other nations as echoes of the golden age of Islam. Fay as a nation is no more. It was once ruled by powerful magic users known as the Red Wizards of Thay, who terrorised and enslaved their neighbours for centuries. But the holy war of King Azun ground Thay down to dust. And after the Cormerian armies returned home with all of the wealth of Thay in tow, Mulharand stepped in and occupied the entire region without much resistance. Though the land remains barren, recovering from the scars of scorched earth warfare, there is prime real estate aplenty for the architects and the engineers of Mulharand to plan great edifices and fortresses that once completed may precipitate further expansions to the north. Inhabitants of Thay speak Mulharandi as their common tongue, with Thayan only spoken in select quarters, and among those who, rem who remember the Halcyon days of old. Ordinary Thayans should refer to the regional equipment options for Mulharand, but in the case of those rare pockets of resistance, and likewise among refugees in foreign lands who hold on to their former traditions and dream of a Red Wizard revival, they may take this alternative package. Such characters speak Thayan as their common tongue, and may take either two second level spell scrolls or one second level and six first level spell scrolls, representing an inheritance saved from the looting of their former homeland. The major faiths of Thay belong to the Mulharandi pantheon which is imposed by the invaders, but worship remains of Bane, Gargoth, Kelimvor, Kossuth, Leviathar, Malar, Shah, Talona, and Umbali. In its heyday, they represented a common fantasy trope of scary Middle Eastern people wielding dark magic. It's been done to death, 
Which is a major reason why I fairly much erased the country off the map. While still, I think, leaving room for innovations and variations on the theme to emerge. Thus, by Faye's relegation to the pages of history, I aim to make room in the landscape for more salient villains. Whilst the inheritors of Thayan culture may play out a postmodern analogue, confronting the value of heritage and the value of cultural identity against the difficulties of navigating culpability for the sins of the father. Aglarond is ruled by a council of magic users in the Sembian style. Though if you ask an Aglarondon, they will tell you it is Sembia who imitates Aglarond. This tiny nation is a paper tiger, exploiting Mulharan's fear and distrust of arcane magic to make themselves appear too dangerous to conquer. But agreeable enough to pose no threat. As such, they play a careful game of sending wondrous tribute to Mulharand, making a show of deference that also projects an image of a nation wealthy and powerful enough to defend itself if need be. Their long history with the Red Wizards makes Aglarond suspicious of outsiders, and they are well aware that if Mulharand annexes Thesk, they will be caught in the middle. And so they are ready to ally with King Vladimir if need be. A fact that Thesk in turn seizes upon to dissuade Mulharandi aggression. Indeed, Aglarond is living proof that northern political machinations are alive and well in the east. Another factor, however, dissuading potential conquerors is that most of the inland territory is thick forest, ruled by the Fae. Aglarondans are hard-working people who incorporate magic into their daily lives, and despite their leaders' political deceptions being a necessary evil, common folk value truthfulness above all else. Inhabitants of Aglarond speak Aglarondian as their common tongue, and for their regional equipment they may pick a suit of studded leather armour or even wizards may need an extra layer of defense from time to time. Or they may take arcane scrolls of web and of wind wall. Or they may take divine scrolls of silence and of spiritual weapon. Both of which reflecting their nation's favor upon spellcasters of all walks. The major faiths of Aglarond are Chontia, Salune, and Valkyr, as well as the reclaimed worship of the Elven Pantheon, with a clarity and continuity not found elsewhere in Faerun, as well as being home to a secret cult of Umberli, whose worship is presently outlawed. Aglarond represents a Slightly confusing mix of Western themes in an Eastern setting. As such, there's a few ways to colour between these lines. You might encapsulate a besieged Crusader kingdom in decline. Or you might reflect another play upon Byzantium. Or you could lean heavily into a Turkish vibe. A Cappadocian theme, for example, might add some spice to this relatively bland dish compared to its flavorful neighbors. Untha is the ancestral homeland of the Mulharandi, where their empire was founded 
and where they were first brought as slaves to Toral by the old Imaskari Empire. After the collapse of Imaskar, Unther was ruled by the Untheric Pantheon, analogous to the gods of ancient Babylon. More recently, Mulharand has returned to their ancestral homelands, not just as conquerors, but also as archaeologists, rediscovering and reclaiming the ancient sites of their past. As well as building dedications and monuments across the landscape in the Mulharandi fashion. Today, most inhabitants of Unther consider themselves Mulharandi and follow the regional rules for creating a character from Mulharand. This entry, however, remains separate to represent the people who maintain their language and culture in secret. Inhabitants of Unther who meet these requirements speak Untheric as their common tongue and may take either a breastplate armor or scale plate, scale mail armor, representing their nation's fame and tradition in the ancient arts of metalworking. Or those connected to the resistance movement against Mulharand may take a scroll of detect thoughts and a potion of misdirection, which when drunk protects against divination spells for an hour. The major faiths of Unther are the Mulharandi Pantheon, as well as Bane, Mistra, Tempus, and Tiamat. Unther represents an historical analog for the successive civilizations that were built on the top of the ancient cities of Mesopotamia, specifically the inheritors of what was once Babylon. Aided by Mulharandi architectural genius, one might well envision the great cities of Persia. Chacenta is an ancient confederation of loosely connected city-states. When they are not at war with Mulharand, these cities fight amongst one another. Thus, Jacentans are rightly viewed as passionate people, never doing anything by the half measure. Despite defeating many waves of invaders, Chacenta has come to be occupied by a vastly superior force from Mulharand. But due to the fragmented nature of the disparate city-states, their occupiers are constantly forced to split their forces to quell rebellions. Indeed, they cannot even force the Chisentan city-states to end the practice of slavery, which is itself abhorrent to Mulharandi law. For this simple demand, if applied, would cause more rebellions than they could presently handle. There is a joke shared among diplomats that Chisentans welcome their enemies as liberators as they approach but are planning their next uprising at the same time. It's funnier in the original Loros, just, just trust me on that. Inhabitants of Chacenta speak Chacentan as their native tongue and receive regional equipment representing the specialty of their home city. Those who form the mighty phalanxes and the elite legions receive either a short sword or a lance. Those who hail from the wealthier cities receive a set of ornate breastplate armor, while those who pursue higher academic pursuits or who serve oracles receive scrolls of blur and levitate. The major faiths of Chacenta are Anhur, Asurin, which is their name for Hoa, 
Azuth, Lathanda, Red Knight, Chazar, which is their name for Tiamat, and Joaquin. Chacenta is a strong and clear analogue for the Hellenistic city-states of ancient Greece. In the current phase of their history, however, they are most comparable to Greece under the occupation of Alexander the Great. Though with their conquerors presently trying their best to ban the Greek, the Greek practice of slavery, perhaps Mulharan is ancient Persia in this allegory, and this is an alternate past where Greece lost the Battle of Thermopylae. Thank you, magpies. And while we now reach the end of our overview of Great Mulharan's greater ambitions, it evokes a tale where the true conflict has yet to emerge and may lead one to wonder, how much can the chalice of the pharaohs overflow before the wine is watered down to nothing. Next time, however, we keep up the heat and raise the humidity as we enter jungles, plains and tropical lands as we explore the south, being the largest of all of the Palatinates, bringing the whole empire into focus. I look forward to seeing you there.